fascinating. I think it's uh, it's a huge story that in some ways is being underplayed. It's it, it has the potential to be um, very disruptive to, to what the norms are in professional golf. And look, I could argue either side of this. You know, like if you asked me, I had to choose one. If I was in a debate class, I had to pick one side. Even if I don't believe it, I could argue it. And so here's the Greg Norman side that I'll give you first. Norman tried this way back in the day when he was a player. At the height of his career, he tried to start a world tour. He had the, the backing of Fox Sports. He was going to play, I believe it was going to be, you know, 10 events with, at that time, $3 million purses, which was considered huge. And everybody wow. was going to be guaranteed money. And his whole thing has always been that as a independent contractor, he should have the right to play wherever he wants. And he told stories about how he would um, go to play in the, in the winter, the Australian summer, in, in, on his home circuit. It, it was, I believe it was then called the, the Australasian Tour. And he wanted to go back there in this time frame, usually December, January, and play a handful of events there. Uh, he had to, in essence, get permission from the PGA Tour. The way it's set up is if you're a PGA Tour member, they own your TV rights, your media rights. If, if you are going to play somewhere else, you've got to get permission or in what they call a release. And you're only allowed three of them. And if you wanted to get a fourth or a fifth or a sixth, they would extract some favor from you. In the case of a guy like Norman, it might oh, be... Wow. We're, we're going to ask you to play two extra events or we're going to ask you to do a clinic or we're going to ask you to do this. And he just felt that was unfair. He felt that, look, I, 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 I play my 15 events on the PGA Tour. That's what, what's required. If I want to go play somewhere else, I should be able to do it. And, you know, look, he's, he's kind of got a point. Um, you know, they are billed as independent contractors. Why aren't they allowed to go wherever they want? So... Now I take the PJ Tour side of it. Well, if you're a member organization, you're going to have rules, right? I mean, if any of us were independent contractors, the people that employ us, even on an independent basis, have some rules and guidelines. Like, you might not be able to do this if you're going to work for us. And that's what the tour does. They, were protect they have been protecting their asset. If, for example, when Tiger and Phil played their match in 2018, mm -hmm. they, in essence, had to get a release to do that. The tour, because they own their media rights, was had to be paid a fee. Phil, to this day, is very upset by that. He thinks that was wrong. But that's the way it works. Because if you didn't do that, what would keep Tiger and Phil from playing an exhibition 10 times a year? Well, that would hurt the PGA Tour. It would detract from their own events. It might possibly take away sponsorship dollars. It would keep those guys from playing their tournaments. So I get that side of it. I get the tour side of it. And, you know, Tiger had a great answer to this last week when he said, my legacy is the PGA Tour. You know, is there going to be a legacy established by, for guys playing against whatever, 40, 50 players on the, you know, Super Golf League? Um, you know, will, will that happen? I mean, I guess you'd have to look at things like, I'm trying to think of other things in sports when there were rival leagues like the USFL in football or way back in the day when the AFL was the rival to the NFL. And they actually had a separate, you know, they didn't play each other. They had a separate um, league. Well, you know, do we care about the, the, the record set in that league back in those days, which really only lasted six or seven years, eight years until they merged. Um, maybe we do, but I mean, that's what you're looking at. I mean, Tiger and Sam Snead are tied. Are we going to care if somebody wins 20 times on the Super Golf League? Um, these, are the, these are the things going back and forth. The other thing that I'll say is the reason that a thing like these, these rival leagues have legs is because pro golfers have no guaranteed money. I mean, yes, they make a lot of money if they're very, very good. They have endorsements. But I'm talking about from the leagues themselves. Steph Curry gets endorsements too. But he's in guarantee. What's he guaranteed? $150 million over the next 
six, yep. eight years. I don't, I, I don't know what his contract is, but it's a lot. <laughs> it's more than Tiger has oh, made yeah. his entire career on the course. And so golfers That's don't great. have the guaranteed money. I use Ricky, Ricky Fowler as an example. He had an off year this year. Didn't even finish in the top 125. Didn't get to partake in the, in, in the, in the FedEx Cup bonus, except for what they pay the guys who finish outside the top 125. He, I believe he made $800,000. Okay, Ricky Fowler's value to the PGA Tour is probably worth a lot more than $800,000. But that's all he got. Because, now, obviously, he has endorsements, but that's not what we're talking about. The top guys in other sports are paid a minimum no matter what. And that's what these other rival leagues are, are offering. The Saudi thing, uh, the PGL. You know, these guys would have no cut events. They'd probably get upfront money just to join. Um, they, they'd be guaranteed a certain amount no matter how well they played. And obviously, if they perform, they're going to get paid a lot, a real lot. I kind of get where they're coming from. And you have to take, a, you have to forget about the fact, well, God, they make so much money anyway. That's not the point. The point is if they have a bad year, they don't make it. If Steph Curry has a bad year, if he's injured, he gets paid. So I, I look, I get both sides of this. I think it's fascinating. 